When you talk about action films, two names that will almost inevitably come up are Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone. They both headline numerous blockbuster action films and have made billions of dollars at the box office. In the 80s, the two were having an unofficial competition where they were trying to one-up each other. Who got the most kills in a movie, who had the biggest muscles, who had the film with the biggest explosions, and so on. As time went on, the two had very different career trajectories. Stallone had a rocky time in the 90s with a string of films that underperformed. He wanted to make a change, so he gained 40 pounds and took on the role of Sheriff Freddie Heflund in Copland. The movie was critically acclaimed and reminded people that Stallone could indeed act. Schwarzenegger's biggest misstep in the 90s was Last Action Hero, which was meant to be a brilliant satire of action films that was completely botched by the studio. It didn't hurt him too much because in the next year he starred in True Lies, which ended up being the third highest grossing film of 1994. In 2003, he put his acting career on hiatus and became the governor of California, which he did until 2011. However different their careers went, there was always one constant, one thing that both fans and film producers wanted, and that was for these two to co-star in a film together. They tried for decades, but one thing or another always prevented it. There were lots of close calls over the years. One of the biggest was when they were the original casting choices for the movie Face Off. It had been hinted at and lampooned, but it always seemed just out of reach. Here we had two of the biggest action stars of all time, and after decades of delays, it looked like they'd be finally co-starring in a film together. Before I get to that, we need to go back a few years to the late 2000s. Miles Chapman was a writer from Philadelphia who was researching prisons for a script he was working on. He spent years researching and writing a script called The Tomb. It was a prison escape movie that was more thriller than action. His concept was this. A brilliant man who runs a security company is being paid to test the integrity of the toughest prisons around the world. It all hinged on this. What kind of man would choose to spend his life in prison? Once the writer figured that out, he had his motivation and the foundation for the script. Before I go any further, I want to say if you haven't seen Escape Plan, I really think you should check it out and then come back to the video. The film's a terrific action thriller, but in talking about it further, I have to discuss some spoilers. I think it's a film best enjoyed without knowing too much beyond the basics. Chapman wanted the script to be unlike any other prison film. He sent a spec script out, and it caught the attention of producers Mark Canton and Robbie Brenner. They shopped it around and it was picked up by Summit Entertainment in 2008. Summit liked the script but needed to fix some things, so Chapman started working on rewrites with Jason Keller. Meanwhile, Stallone had started his homage to all things action with The Expendables. Stallone had asked Schwarzenegger to be in the film, but he was still the governor at the time and couldn't take the time off to make a movie. Stallone asked if he could film on weekends. Schwarzenegger looked into it, and since his weekends were indeed his to do with what he wanted, he shot a cameo sequence for the first movie on a Saturday afternoon in about four hours. For part two, he went back and shot for a total of four days, all on the weekend. While fans were happy to see this, they still were only in the movies together, not co-starring together. Back at Summit, the tomb had its star, Bruce Willis. It was going to be directed by Antoine Fuqua. Summit wanted to fast-track the film, but the deal fell through. So Willis went off to work on Kane and Lynch, which never happened, and Fuqua went off to direct Olympus's Fallen. They needed to get someone to helm the production, and hired Swedish director Michael Hafström. Hafström had just directed the mystery drama The Right with Anthony Hopkins. The studio liked his style and felt he would be the right choice to handle what they called a high-end head game. With the new script, a producer sent a copy to Stallone on behalf of Summit, Stallone read it and was flabbergasted. Hafstrom flew out to Bulgaria, where Stallone was shooting The Expendables 2. They spoke, and he decided to be in the movie, in the role of the evil warden Hobbs. The script went in for another rewrite, and upon reading this version, it seemed to make more sense to have Stallone play the lead character of Ray Breslin, the head of the security company who breaks out of prisons. Stallone agreed, and now they needed an equal heavyweight to play his co-star, Rottmeier. They wanted to do something like Heat where you had Al Pacino and Robert De Niro playing off each other for the first time. So who else would fit better than Arnold Schwarzenegger? Producer Mark Kenton always wanted Stallone and Schwarzenegger together. He tried before in previous films, but it never happened for various reasons, mostly scheduling conflicts. This time with Schwarzenegger no longer in office, and since his schedule was open, they were able to bring him on for the tomb. When Schwarzenegger joined, it became obvious this movie was going to have to have much more action. So the writers returned to the script and added in more action, without steering too far away from the original intent of the film. For Chapman, this was a dream come true, to have two of the biggest action stars he grew up watching starring in a film he wrote. With Stallone switching to Breslin, they needed to find someone to play the warden. They interviewed numerous actors, but no one was right. 
Finally, one day, the director got an email from the agent of Jim Caviezel. Hafstrom had seen him in plenty of movies, and it hit him that Jim was the guy they were looking for. He liked the idea of having Caviezel as the warden because it was drastically different from prison wardens in other movies. Hafstrom spoke to Stallone, and they hired rapper 50 Cent to play Breslin's employee and friend, Hush. Hush was a computer hacker Breslin met one of his times in prison, and they hit it off. After he got out, Breslin hired him because his skills were unmatched. They hired Vincent D'Onofrio to play Breslin's business partner, Lester Clark. Amy Ryan was hired to play Breslin's other associate, Abigail. Ferran Tahir was hired to play one of the prisoners, Javid. Sam Neill was hired to play the doctor. In the script, he was Russian, but they decided to skip that in the film because it really changed nothing about the character and saved them from having him put on a fake Russian accent. Vinnie Jones was hired to play Drake, the head security officer. The budget was about $54 million, which wasn't cheap, but also wasn't huge considering the star power involved. They had to be frugal with how they were spending, but that wasn't easy. How do you make a film about a high-tech futuristic prison in a way that doesn't break the bank? They need a location where they could build a giant prison interior and found the NASA Michoud Assembly Facility in New Orleans East. The facility was huge, and the area where they'd be filming was where they built parts of the space shuttle. With the space shuttle program being shut down in 2011, the building wasn't being used. The vertical assembly building was 263 feet high and presented them with more than enough space to build their futuristic prison. With this enormous location, they planned to shoot about 90% of the film there. Since this already was essentially a factory, much of the interior of the building just needed to be slightly redressed for the film. They already had the stairs and scaffolding, so they just needed to build the prison cells. They wanted the prison to be like nothing that had ever been seen before. They consulted with prison experts and were able to configure the ultimate inescapable prison. Glass walls, faceless guards, and round-the-clock surveillance. This was a place where if you were unfortunately sent, you were not getting out. The design of the prison was based on a panopticon. A panopticon is a type of building designed by philosopher and social theorist Jeremy Bentham. The design goes all the way back to the 1700s. It was designed as a way to regulate prisoners' behavior by making them think they are being watched at all times. This was a method that crushed all free will and prevented them from being able to keep secrets. It was a way to make them as uncomfortable as possible. It was a design that could also be used in schools, hospitals, and asylums. The cells in the tomb were a block of four to five glass cells, each in a location that could be easily looked into at any and all times. With the infrastructure in place, they just had to add in some fences, tables, and other things to give the place the proper look of a prison. The bonus was that it was cheap. It also gave it a mix of old school and new school. Prison tech from the past meets prison tech of the future. While the interior shooting location was on land, the exterior was in the ocean. They came up with the idea after talking to the prison experts and discovering an early type of confinement called hulks. These were large ships that they turned into prison cells. They used this as another way to make sure the prisoners couldn't escape. Even if they made it outside, they'd soon discover they were in the middle of the ocean. For the exterior shoot, they found a cargo ship in the New Orleans Harbor. Unfortunately, the ship was much smaller than what they needed, so they planned to shoot the exteriors and then use CG to extend the ship and remove the land. They started filming in April of 2012. The movie opens in a prison in Louisiana, which they use CG to make it Colorado. While writing the script, Chapman researched older prison films and studied the tropes that were most common amongst them. He did this so he could actively avoid them with his script. To make something that feels on the surface like one thing, but then you discover it is something else entirely. In the opening, they purposefully presented us with a prison like we had seen in movies before. We then see Breslin escape, and then later he reveals to the warden how he did it. This was a way to show the audience this guy was a savant and can easily break out of the prisons we've seen in movies before. They spent a lot of time figuring out how Breslin would escape from the prisons. Hafstrom gave the script to the prison experts, who helped them to add in some elements to make it more realistic. The ideas they gave them were from real prison breaks in the past, like the balls of toilet paper. They tried to make it all believable and work with the prison experts to make the adjustments where needed. They wanted this to be the ultimate prison break movie. Two legendary action heroes escaping from the inescapable futuristic prison. The two actors worked with the writer and director to figure out the balance of how and why these two would become friends. They didn't want to rush into it. They needed it to feel natural or the film wouldn't work. When we first see the Panopticon prison cells, it's a practical location, but then it backs up into a visual effects shot to make the area look even bigger. It also saved them from having to build more cells than they needed. The main area in the facility they nicknamed Babylon. 
The reason was because the place was so huge, all the voices echoed. They had detainees from all over the world, and since they were talking in different languages, the whole place just sounded like Babel. They worked hard to make the guards' masks not hokey. They went through numerous designs and found the best one that worked was a blank, one-color, expressionless face. They also had glasses in them, so you couldn't see their eyes. They wanted to make it clear that this was not a prison for terrorists. This was a prison where powerful people were disappeared. They had enemies that wanted to make sure they were never heard from again. They didn't have them killed because most often they had information they were trying to get, and they couldn't if the person was dead. In the case of Breslin, having the guy who wrote the book on prison escapes being placed in a prison he couldn't get out of made his life priceless to them. Having him locked up would prove to others that this place was worth investing in and dumping in an enemy or two. That made the place so much more sinister than just a high-tech prison. As things progressed, they realized something was missing. There was no fight between Stallone and Schwarzenegger. This was something they knew the fans would want, so they wrote in a segment where the two go at it. It also gave way to this line. <laughs> you hit like a vegetarian. This was a callback to a previous scene where Rottmeier finds out that Breslin's a vegetarian. They cut that scene because it wasn't really necessary, and the vegetarian light still worked without the setup. The solitary confinement hotbox area was done using special lights that had intensity, but didn't generate heat like in the movie. That way they could get the right look, but not actually torture the cast and crew. For the scene where Breslin's using a polished piece of metal, that was something the writer learned at a campsite. You could use toothpaste to polish the metal, and then reflect the sunlight to start a fire, or in this case, heat up metal. The director worked with Schwarzenegger to flesh out the scenes when he was going crazy in the hot box. He wrote his lines with him and then translated them into German. They tried a few ideas, like Arnold singing opera or giving Colonel Kurtz lines in German, but ultimately cut it down to keep it from getting silly. Both Schwarzenegger and Stallone did as much of their own stunts as possible. The warden collecting butterflies was to show that as a child, he collected butterflies and placed them in glass boxes. Now that he's an adult, he collects men and places them in glass boxes. Chapman wrote the film to take a major left turn at the one hour mark. The whole time Breslin needs to get outside and figure out where they are. He believes they're in a cave underground. In other movies, the character would see where they were and then proceed to figure out how to escape. In this case, he sees that they aren't where he thought they were, and now he's back to square one. They were on a boat somewhere in the ocean, and he had no idea what he was going to do next. Making him work so hard and then pulling the rug out from under him was the plan from the beginning. It made that reveal so much more devastating. They wanted the audience to be blindsided just like Breslin. Chapman wrote this to be like a classic episode of Star Trek. Halfway through the episode, it seems like all is lost, and then they figure things out and survive. The one hour mark was the perfect place to start over. When Chapman was doing his research, he discovered that all prisons, even a gulag, had doctors. He wrote the doctor character in there as someone Breslin could plead to his good side and convince them to help him out. The character of Javed was a Muslim, they didn't want to go with the cliché of him being a terrorist, so they made him an opium dealer. The prop department built a real working sextant out of the materials that you could acquire while in prison. The fight towards the end between Breslin and Drake was shot in the real engine room of the ship they were renting. When Chapman found out they cast Schwarzenegger, he went back and wrote in a scene where he takes off a mounted gun and mows down a wave of enemies. Also, being from Philly, he was talking with Stallone about one of the fight sequences, and Stallone gave him a fake punch. So essentially, he was being fake punched by Rocky. He said it was the highlight of his career. The second to last day of filming, Stallone pulled his right bicep muscle while doing a stunt. Thankfully, they only had one day left to shoot, which was the scene where Breslin's getting picked up by the helicopter. His right arm was injured, so he waves and starts climbing with his left arm. The writer and director were having a long debate over if the warden should be killed. Initially, they thought seeing the two escape from his prized prison would be punishment enough, but the awful things he did throughout the film had them reconsider and they decided he should be offed. They then had to figure out how they would do it. While they were working on the boat, they saw it was loaded with oil barrels, and then they rode in the scene where they blow up the warden. Since they were trying to blaze a new trail, they kept the action cliches to a minimum, although they did sneak in a funny one-liner at the end. Have a lovely day, asshole. The beach at the end was a few miles from New Orleans. After about 10 weeks of shooting, the film wrapped and they moved into post. The movie was slated to be released in April of 2013. April arrived, and they moved the release to September. They also announced they changed the name from The Tomb to Escape Plan. It was delayed again and then finally released on October 18th, 2013, where it opened in fourth place. It lost out to Gravity, 
Captain Phillips, and the remake of Carrie. It only made $25 million in the U.S., but it did better overseas, making over $112 million. Sadly, it seemed like audiences in 2013 weren't as excited to see Stallone and Schwarzenegger together as they were back in the 80s and 90s. Even though the film underperformed, producer Mark Canton saw this as a franchise that would revolve around Breslin. He was right. In 2018, they released Escape Plan 2, Hades, and then in 2019, they released Escape Plan, The Extractors. Both went direct-to-video. They were starring Stallone, but Arnold didn't return, and they had Dave Bautista play a new character, Trent. Stallone recently came out about Part 2, saying it was the most horribly produced film of his career. Part 3, however, he was very proud of. He worked on Part 3 with his longtime friend John Hersfeld. As of currently, Stallone hasn't said who is to blame for Part 2 being so mismanaged. Escape Plan may have underperformed, but in the end, Stallone and Schwarzenegger finally co-starred in something they're proud of. The two had fun working with each other, and they were able to appreciate each other's talents more. The duo met up again in The Expendables 3 in 2014. Escape Plan is a terrific thinking man's action movie. It's much smarter than it gets credit for, and is overwhelmingly entertaining. The cast is outstanding, the location is unique, and the whole thing is wonderfully paced. It keeps you engaged, and not just with action, but with a well-told story. You're rooting for Breslin to use his MacGyver skills to figure out this insane prison and break out. Seeing Stallone and Schwarzenegger together after all these years was a definite treat. It's a bummer it took so long, but at least it was worth it. The movie's not just some mindless junk, and I think they're both older and matured enough so that the film wasn't just a two-hour pissing match. If you like the old guard of action movies and somehow miss this one, you need to remedy that quickly. Escape Plan's a great film that more folks need to see. Although apparently, you can skip part two.